The title of this panel is Communication Networks and Networks of Comparative Research. This panel has three papers and four presenters, uh, four panelists, not, not presenters. Uh, the first, uh, first panelist is uh, Professor Barry uh, Wellman of uh, University of Toronto. And the second panelist is uh, Professor Wang Qi, Jiujie Wang of Taiwan National Chengji University. The third panelist is uh, Professor Christine Wang of CUHK. And uh, the last panelist is uh, Joseph Chen of CUHK. Uh, each panelist will have 15 minutes to present his or her papers. And, uh, oh, sorry, I forgot our discussion. Our discussion is Chen Lin. Chen Lin is a professor of communication at the Hong Kong Baptist University. Uh, the discussion will have 15 minutes uh, to make comments of the papers. Uh, first, I would like to invite Professor Wellman to be our first presenter. You all know who I am now, and I only have 15 minutes instead of 20, so we'll keep going, and we're having trouble, okay, with this. What I want to do is talk- Sorry, I'm uh, sorry, it's my mistake. 20 minutes, you'll have 20 minutes, sorry. <laughs> okay, well, I would take it anyway. <laughs> and I'm gonna try to present a lot of different things in 20 minutes, and of course, this is basically an opening preamble for the uh, further discussions that we would have informally. And I particularly want some of the students who have been sitting so eagerly in the back to uh, engage in these discussions. I've been, and here's my outline, which I won't take the time to read, but it is based on work that I've done with Lee Rainey, the director of the Pew Internet and American Life Project, and a book we have out called Networked uh, that has won some awards and is a pretty nice book. I'm curious, does anybody here own the copy of the book? So Bill, you get a free uh, class of beer later and Alice owns it too, that's fantastic. Yeah. So three things have happened in the triple revolution. The first is the social network revolution. People have been kind enough to talk about social networks this morning, uh, Christine in particular, and starting at least as far back as the 1960s, and this is mostly in North America, we've seen people change from being embedded in groups, that is where they were bound up in one work group, such as in the mainland Chinese uh, situation or being totally bound up by families in North America to involvement in multiple networks in which they have many different relationships and each one has only a partial commitment uh, to their time. There are very few people like me dedicating a 50-year career to one university and to one wife. Uh, both those things have changed a little bit. Don't laugh. And I am at National University of Singapore now. One of the discussions I'm having with my students is whether uh, Asian commitments to family uh, make whether this turn to social networks uh, true in Asia. I believe it is, but to a different extent than in North America. The second revolution, which you all know about, is uh, the internet revolution. But in addition to the obvious stuff, uh, it has facilitated the turn to social networks because you can switch around between different groups and because it is a personal means of communication. Jack Chu this morning was talking about the term mobilized uh, that society that I invented back in the 90s. Well, also we'll invent a new one, personalized. You log on as an individual. In fact, I need some log help logging on uh, to the internet here. But um, it's very different than when telephones came to your house. Now uh, they come to your handphone, and 
people have their own ways of relating. And then finally, the mobile revolution, as Bill Dutton was especially pointing out this morning, is becoming a different world than the internet revolution. Uh, taxi drivers no longer sit by themselves. They talk with their families and friends. Assembly line workers, uh, when they can even get out in bio breaks to go to the washroom, uh, can check in with family and friends. On the other hand, technology keeps people who used to be isolated under surveillance. People who drive long distance trucks are very much under surveillance. But as Leopoldina Fortunati has spoken about, uh, the, the, the mobile phone has become a third skin along with uh, our clothes and our own skin. So the argument we make in our book is that people function more as connected individuals, that they're less embedded in groups. Much of my own work has been about friendships and kinship, but that's not what I'm going to talk about now. But we've discovered that people in North America have far fewer neighboring relationships than in the past, but they have many more relation, uh, ties. The average North American knows 600 people, has close ties with about seven or eight, and pretty good ties with about 20 to 50. So let's just compare the transition to network work that I want to make. Remember the original work modes, people rarely were networked. They were either shopkeepers staying by themselves, such as stalls, or family farm workers in small groups, or like Foxconn workers uh, in large factories uh, producing mobile phones. Is Mad Men been shown in Hong Kong or in, else in Asia, the, the American show? Yes? You much, you've on watch as Mad Men. So that is, if you remember that show, people are multitasking with a cigarette in their hand. Now what do we have? We have mobile phones. Um, we have in that show in-person communication, I, just like we're doing at this conference. I go over to talk to you to talk, and it was predominantly men in white shirts, ties, and very few women, and they were mostly sexual objects. And families were very much separated from the workplace. When a man left home at, at 8 o'clock in the morning to go to work, his family, his wife, and his children stayed home. If you remember, the women in, in Mad Men were very, very isolated. Now the cigarette has become a smartphone. We haven't figured out how to hold cigarette, smartphone, drive a car all at one time. The notepad has become a laptop. Organizations much more include women. And dress codes, although not here, have become more informal. I was told I didn't need a tie or a jacket to come here. Some people, well, true. So this is very much with the triple revolution in, um, where the mobile phone, the internet, and the turn to social networks has led to what we call networked individualism. That is that people switch around in different groups, they function, and they have to work much harder to stay as connectivity as an individual. In some ways, I'm thinking that the Lunar New Year works more powerfully now in Hong Kong, Singapore, and even the mainland, because families are dispersing, and therefore this is a very important time to get back together from dispersed families. But let's look at the changes for the rest of today and what's happened in work. Um, in the old days, people made things, be they scarves, be they shirts. Uh, they moved things around logistically. Now, Hong Kong is still a great port, so that's partially true. But all of us in this room are moving bits around, computerized bits. We're, we're working on computers. And we tend to be in networked organizations that tend to be flatter and less hierarchical. And I can't tell about Hong Kong, but in, in North America, they tend to be people in multiple diverse teams. When we interview people, we find out that um, 
that, how could I put this, that they, they are in multiple teams that get together to meet maybe four or five, six time, different groups during a week, and that they're reporting to many different masters. I don't know if this resonates with your life in Hong Kong, but certainly resonates with the academic life. And people are, of course, using not only in-person, which certainly stays true, but digital media to collaborate with. And the work-family divide is being bridged. I've already been on my mobile phone and my internet with, with my family today and, and on the internet with my students today. So the old strong divide between family and work doesn't exist. So workers are, in fact, not as solitary as they used to be uh, because they're connected in these ways. Uh, knowledge workers such as ourselves, they can move around among multiple sets of relationships. They often work in distributed way. How many people here collaborate with somebody not in their own university? That's a large chunk of you. And students here, are you beginning to form relations with people outside the university? I can't hear you. Of course. And that's one of the pleasures of this conference is the networks you're going to make. So we're distributed work. We, not, we don't see each other physically. But one of the secrets our research has found is you cannot work together with people unless you see them once in a while and even smell and touch them, because then you know what they're really like, or at least part of what they're really like. So somebody once wrote a silly book called The Death of Distance, uh, Francis Cancross, and that sold a lot of copies, but it was wrong. By the way, one of my observations is, is books that are wrong tend to sell more copies, because they're more, more exciting. Uh, so it turns out that many scholars, people like ourselves, are network workers. And when we did a study, which we've just mostly completed, of people who do scholarship together over a distance or in teams in the same university, we find that there's implications for how people work together uh, who are not scholars. Turns out there's a lot of talk, a lot of hype about how people work in networks, but very little systematic knowledge. And scholars love this stuff. Why are people here? They want to see Hong Kong. Uh, they want to have great Western food in the staff club. Um, but w we join in these adventures uh, to large research networks, basically for the adventure of it, to discover wider worlds. I'm certainly learning a lot. Every time I talk to you and ask you about your home life, um, I learn a lot. Uh, we gain some material and intellectual benefits with larger grants. And then sometimes we're ordered to do that. I don't know. I, I, I don't dare. But some of the student helpers may have volunteered, and some may have been told, you got to go there, or both. So we're studying a network of scholars all across Canada. Canada is almost as wide as China, but a little bit emptier. In fact, I just made that sentence up. It's about 8,000 kilometers from Nova Scotia on the east coast of, of, of Canada to Victoria on the west coast. I live now in, in Toronto, which is over here, where the temperature is minus 10, and I'm very happy to be here. <laughs> now, to when we started editing a special issue of the American Behavioral Scientist, we expected to see major differences between network scholars, network researchers, and network workers in organizations. But we were wrong, flat wrong. Unlike theorists, we can be wrong. Network scholars, we find, behave like other network workers. And we found even humanists. Oh, I I'm sorry about that. I'll repeat that sentence, no. Um, <laughs> Network, I want to be like Madonna with it here. Um, and we find even people who are in the humanities, the arts, English literature, Chinese literature, behave much like scientists in network work situations. Now, Vincent Chua of National University of Sociology, Socio 
of, of Singapore sociology department, I have just finished editing a special issue of the American Behavioral Scientist. Some of the work is online already on the early views. Uh, the rest of it, it, it's a SAGE publication, is coming out very soon in April. And as you can see, I'm not going to read off all of these things. We studied both network researchers, network scholars, and people who work in other jobs that involve white collar work. And we have a very distinguished set of scholars with us. I'm going to, just in the brief time I have left, uh, discuss what we found. The rest of the information is on our website. And everything I say is true for scholars, but also for other forms of network workers. We find that many of the ties that people form are short-lived. They live for the basis of the project. To keep going, they have to have a commitment to a, a long-term goal, and they have to see each other once in a while. So one of the uh, advantages or disadvantages, but, but phenomena of network work, is that there's no formal structure that binds people together. So when people are distant and they come from other places or other institutional units, uh, the ties do not last that long. Sometimes network work is with distributed work. Distributed work means spread out over a distance where people aren't co-located. But sometimes network work um, can be people in the same building who go from committee meeting to committee meeting, as many of you do, even though um, they're in different groups in different spaces. We found physical proximity, being close to each other as we are now, still matters for social and work relations. Also what matters is informal communication. If I asked you what's the most important part of this conference, uh, I think if you were honest, you would say the informal times we have to talk with each other when we really get to know each other. These papers are just an excuse to, to pay travel budgets for us. So digital media, or new media, a term as Bill Dutton says will probably die out pretty soon, because you know when I started, new media was the abacus uh, and the uh, dial-up phone, actually helps collaboration as long as you couple it with, inter with, with uh, physical communication. And it turns out that when we map where people are communicating, we find out that the world is lumpy. You remember Tom Friedman wrote a book, I think it probably circulated here, called The World is Flat. Another guy who made a million dollars, but the title is, is absolutely untrue because most of us don't communicate excuse me, with a random spread around the world, we communicate with people specifically in different locations. I know I'm going to have many more friends in Hong Kong after this trip. So you're my lump, OK? But we're not sure what, how much distance affects productivity. We're just applying for a large research grant from Canada to find that out. We find out that. As I've said before, and it's a bit of a repeat, people tend to work best with those who are near each other and those with whom they have frequent in-person in contact and are also in pretty similar kind of jobs. So similarity pays off. This is hard data. I'm not just making this up. Uh, people who know each other, I paid $5 for an extra five minutes. I wanted to be <laughs> in force. I love the fact when you go to Malaya that for $20 you're allowed to speed. Um, but people tend to work with those in, in similar professions because they understand each other better. But in the same, idea, same time, we found that diversity is really, really important because it pays off in having innovative ideas that lead to more productivity. This was my just completed doctoral student Mo Guangying's dissertation was about this. But here's the paradox. To get that kind of diversity, you require trust. And in some ways, to get trust, you need similarity. So there's a dialectic going on between similarity and diversity. And those who know 
to navigate this, as Ron Bird has pointed out, in structural holes, really uh, get good payoffs. Status pays off. Our evidence shows very strongly that higher ranked people ask more for advice, and social structure pays off within the workplace. Our evidence also shows strongly those more central and communication flows pay off. We also find that friendship pays off. Another great thing about this conference, great collaborations will result because people who become friends and like each other tend to collaborate more and collaborate over longer term kinds of stuff. And so does working together. Most of the time, not always, I've had some horrible co-authors, those who you work together with tend uh, to stay, develop friendships. So there's a dialectic, and these were my friends and collaborators uh, in Toronto from the project. We have an Israeli guy, Hong Kong woman, Diana Mock up in the upper left-hand corner, uh, mainland Chinese, uh, Zhou Lin and Mo, and Mo Guangying, and this is very much a Toronto situation. Lots of different people. And now I'm particularly collaborating with, uh, with Anatoly Gruz, who's now a professor in Toronto. Oops, wrong button. So as I said, the issue is coming out. And the other issue that's coming out, actually, too, we've been talking about the need for Chinese and East Asian scholarship. So Vincent Chua, who was my student in Toronto, is now assistant professor of sociology at NUS. Uh, we decided that the best research in the next 10 years is coming out of Western educated, I'm sorry, CUHK, but Western educated um, students with an East Asian background. And we put out a call for papers and we got 18 of them. I think Jack, you're in this issue, aren't you, maybe? Uh, anybody else? Jack Barbelay from uh, sociology here is in it. And we're, we got so many good papers that we, we're putting it out in two issues. We were lucky to get the journal to agree. And one of the things we're talking to is about the, what we started this conversation with is the transformation to networked individualism, but very much in a kinship-based East, Southeast, and maybe uh, Southern Asian way. OK, so to finish. Perfectly timed. Uh, network work is part of the current changes in social reality. There's Foxconn in one hand, there's network work in the other, but it's parting as an uh, integral part of the turn to a network society and the broad transformation of work in society and networked individualism. Nevertheless, travel to trust still holds. I don't know if you'll trust me now, but you might trust me before, which is why we're here. And I think that's all. Is there applause or? Yep, that's all. Thank you very much. The second paper will be presented by Professor Jiu Wang and uh, Christian Huang. The title of the paper is oh, Comparative Guanxi Research Following the Commensurability and Incommensurability Model. Professor Wang, please. Thank you, uh, Professor Lo. Uh, I would like to first of all thank the uh, organizer for having me here at the conference. Four years into retirement, I sometimes see myself more of a truffle grower than I am an academic. Um, but it is um, very much, I am very much appreciative of the opportunity to reacquaint myself with the excitement of academic debate. I would also like to thank uh, Christine Huang for venturing with me into this no man's land of commensurability and incommensurability. It's um, a lot of courage, but also silliness, I'm sorry. Um, and also, um, last, uh, an apology for the state of the paper you see in the proceeding. The fall is all mine, but we have continued to work on it, so we have now a new version of it. And please do let us know if you'd like to have a copy. Okay, um, and a second apology is that, as you can see, uh, we have also changed our title in the new version. Um, the uh, title now is From Collectivism to the Dual Factor Relational Framework Tracing the Path to Commensurability. 
essentially what we are trying to do here is rather than um, seeing contextualization as a solution to the problem of uninformed comparisons, quote unquote, uh, we propose an alternative. And this is the alternative of using what we call commensurable similarity as a basis for comparisons, especially comparisons that are aimed at enhancing the generality of concepts and theories. And secondly, we try to use Chinese relationship study as a case to trace the path from discovering and interpreting the incommensurability involved in applying important concepts and theories to a focus on cultural particularities. And then from there, from commensurable similarities emerging from the above to similarities that may enlighten future research on human relationships. And then last, uh, lastly, but not leastly, uh, we try to illustrate the above points at the empirical level by examining emergent data patterns from a survey using an analytical instrument that's specifically tailored to the study of Chinese relationships. And this is the dual factor relational framework designed by my co-author Christine Huang and her colleague, Dr. Bedford. Now, many of you may ask, why is there the need for an alternative? And here we have to start with um, the concept of concept contextualization itself. We now understand that the key to success in comparative research is contextualization because contextual influences determines whether concepts and theories can be generalized. And then they also lay the conditions under which validity can be upheld. Therefore, to put theories and concepts to robust test, comparisons need to be made across different systems and cultures. Unfortunately, greater diversity requires more sophisticated contextual analyses, thicker interpretations, and more conditions for generalization to hold, and therefore risking to erode the comparability of the study. In regard to this problem, um, Gurevich and Blummer had offered two sol solutions. One is to control extraneous forces by conducting research in countries and systems that are closely similar, but that is, as we have seen, um, defeating um, the purpose. And secondly, building them into the research design. But this is essentially an ideal, as they admitted that we are still a long way from knowing how in practical detail to handle any such difficulty when it arises. So some 40 years later, we have become more context sensitive. But are we now fully prepared to handle the difficulty when it arises. And we, if we think a little further, we will find ourselves <coughs> encountered with two questions, two more questions. First, is it paradoxical to expect scientific research to be fully contextualized while trying to advance generality? Because contextualization is very often about history, culture, and everything that's particular about a, a, a subject or concept or a place. It is the dichotomous extreme to generality slash universalities and particularity and universality slash generality are normally considered as the two dichotomous extremes of a continuum. And secondly, can contextualization at the methodological level solve the problem of uninformed comparisons? This is important, especially if we try to enhance the validity and uh, generality of theories and concepts, because they are contextual themselves. They reflect the concerns, aspirations, cultural values, and worldview of their home. In other words, there's not just a matter of different cultures, but maybe we're talking about different paradigms, knowledge paradigms. And when talking about paradigm shift, 
Thomas Kuhn has said, there exist in between successive paradigms incommensurable differences. And by incommensurability, he meant irreconcilable differences. They are in irreconcilable because differences are not translatable, as it is not possible to find equivalent words or strings of words in another language. However, they are still interpretable because with sufficient effort, they can be learned, explained, and still be compared across paradigms. They are comparable because commensurable similarities are brought out in the process of interpreting commensurable, incommensurable differences. As by interpretation, we need to rely on common uh, meaning, uh, shared meaning and also common experiences, and they are the basis for commensurable similarities. Therefore, one comes out of the other. That means the two are not dichotomous extremes. They are symbiotic. They also clash and reach but define one another. And we feel that Chinese relationship study provides an especially interesting example because they show how the need to establish conceptual incommensurability has led local academics away from mainstream theories, but how research in local contexts accumulated over time began to reveal commensurable similarities and points of convergence. Here, uh, we can roughly divide, divide studies of Chinese relationships into three stages. The first two stages, the focus is placed on the unique aspects of Chinese relationships. But the problem of incommensurability with using the concept of collectivism and individualism in studying the way Chinese relate to others had surfaced after the 1990s. And after this, this, period, uh, this time, Emphasis on both, there's emphasis on both the unique and the shared aspects of human relationship. And this emphasis is supported by first a growing body of literature that involves human relations in mainstream research. For example, social capital, social exchange, social networks, and personal ties, as we, as we have just heard from Barry. And then there's also greater effort to incorporate the formerly extraneous factors in research. For example, the addition of long-term versus short-term orientation in Hofstadt's theory of cultural dimension. Therefore, over time, the exploration, understanding, and interpretation of incommensurable differences have helped tease out commensurable similarities. And here, in this study, um, we are we locate ourselves somehow in between quantitative and qualitative approach to, to research um, because there are several equivalents to the concept of Chinese relationships in um, mainstream literature, but none embraces its meaning full. So when we discuss differences and similarities, we will focus on basically three equivalent concept, concepts or sets of con concepts that is in individualism, collectivism, social capital, and the structuration um, theory by Giddens. Yeah, I'm not sure if we have uh, the time for uh, this, but it's there if you like to take a look later on. I'll skip that. And the, um, uh, also, I'm going to skip the significance of adding the empirical dimension, uh, dimension to our discussion. Um, I would just like to say that um, um, it is perhaps not possible to um, co draw conclusions on the adequacy of incommensurable um, uh, differences or commensurable similarity based on statistical tests, especially those from a single study. But it may, it does reflect on such claims. Okay. Um, as we have very limited time, I think I'm just going to hand the rest to Christine.
Okay, um, <clears throat> I have seven minutes to run like I'm um, 20 something slides. So uh, maybe that's the sources of my allergy for this past several days. Okay, anyway, inco incorporate, uh, in response to uh, address some um, the problems of um, uh, individual, uh, individualism and collectivism, um, this framework has been developed to address the problems. And the theories basically draw, um, um, uh, the framework I call dual factor relational uh, framework, I will call that DFRF later on, and the literature was drawn from uh, relational orientation from Yang Guoshu, uh, relational cent uh, centeredness um, from Zhuo Bin, face and favor model from Huang Guangguo, <coughs> and rational relational um, relations concept from myself. And basically, this um, framework cons uh, proposed to uh, propose that um, two um, Factors that is structure factor, structure factors and uh, rational factor coexist, but they are in they are uh, separate by intercorrelated um, factors. And under um, uh, structure factors, there are five uh, distinct but intercorrelated um, concepts, uh, which is, is um, fatalism, uh, raw emphasis, some um, uh, classification harmony, and interdependence. And under a uh, rational factor, um, there are four uh, um, dimensions, that is resources, importance, advantages, and reliance. And this table uh, depicts um, the definitions of um, each factor and dimensions. I would just, you know, I want to emphasize uh, several uh, to you because um, maybe that is some, uh, some of them is not uh, familiar with you, such as some cla relational classification. Um, the definition is that the tendency to di differentiate the relationship according to the degree of um, intimacy and hi hierarchy. And fatalism is that the belief that certain relationships are meant to happen and um, the duration or even outcomes of the relationship is pre determined. Okay, and um, this framework addresses um, the concerns that structural model neglect agency and the rational model neglect um, external factors. And each element provides, you know, what the other lacks. And these factors do not exist at the opposite ends of um, the continuum, and they form two older, uh, two higher order intercorrelated but separate uh, constructs. And um, as for the research questions, you know, um, we would like to ex um, examine, you know, to what extent does um, this factor, this model exists in the three uh, modern uh, Chinese societies. And how do the different uh, differences and similarities present themselves? And a uh, survey uh, is used um, as um, the research method and um, um, student, uh, college students as some um, target respondents. And um, taking into account um, 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 demo, uh, um, geographic and economic diversities, um, Yunnan and uh, Shanghai was selected. And um, the data was collected from um, Fudan University, Yunnan University, CUHK Yunnan University, and uh, Zhongshan University in Taiwan. And five liberal arts classes were randomly sampled by computer at each university with students from different faculties. Um, because of time constraint, okay, you can look at you know the, the sample size here. And um, respondents are instructed to think how they perceive relationship at, by five um, point like scale and um, this is a summary of the step employed to assure the validity and uh, reliability of um, the structure and as you can see from um, the figure um, basically um, the structural equation modeling demonstrate um, the validity the structural validity and also evidence of the CFI Cronbach's alpha and uh, construct reliability um, of um, the framework across four samples lend support to the effectiveness of um, the framework okay here comes some of the results um, um, because um, this study is um, exploratory in nature um, so we don't aim for um, a hypothesis testing but we would like to provide insights into uh, the patterns of how this framework um, exists among three modern Chinese societies. Um, okay, uh, let me go through um, the report. Okay, as you can see that um, um, the conversion um, patterns uh, exist that um, um, 
rational, rational factor has some greater um, mean than a structure factor, but structure factor has some um, uh, less um, uh, uh, standard deviation. And for the five dimensions under structure, uh, structure model, two convergent um, um, patterns show. As you can see that um, harmony and raw emphasis were rated as some the top uh, the top two uh, values but um, fatalism and classification um, acquired the, the largest um, standard deviation and um, the divergent um, the divergent uh, pattern shows that Taiwan and Hong Kong as a group show significant higher mean score orientation and lower standard deviation so we would say that um, Hong Kong and Taiwan have more institutionalized um, uh, traditions where the citizens follow more intensively to social norms therefore they tend to be more receptive to their res uh, relationship destiny and value more on interdependence among citizens to form a com community. And as for um, the rational factor, basically we um, report um, the convergence because only convergent patterns um, exist across um, three regions and four universities. As a, and as you can see from here, that respondents across four regions deem relationship work guanxi as resources, and they also uh, highly agree that relationships is important in many respects. Um, let me just give you a very, very uh, a, a brief summary about um, the major findings here. The structural factor is relatively more powerful in discerning regional differences. And Hong Kong and Taiwan are more structurally relationship oriented than mainland Chinese some respondents. Hong Kong and Taiwan are more fatalism uh, oriented and have um, sh greater tendencies towards um, interdependence than mainland Chinese. And so we, uh, we said that Hong Kong and Taiwan are more oriented to the prescribed um, structure elements in interpersonal relationship, such as um, seniority, fam uh, family, and the rule of um, interdependence. As for, in contrast, okay, rational factors does not discern regional uh, differences and all four universities across um, uh, three regions value the importance of relationship as resources. And um, I um, try to, since um, this framework is aimed to um, uh, apply to um, cross, um, okay, um, countries or uh, cultures other than other than China or Chinese. So I um, try to um, look for if there's any implications can draw from um, the findings to shed light on the areas acquired potentials for distinguishing cross-cultural differences or even cross-cultural incommensurabilities. And, okay, three minutes. Okay, so I have one more minute. Um, okay, um, I use some two dimensions um, to distinguish these um, this, um, characteristics. And, and, and as you can see that um, these relational characteristics that um, across three uh, Chinese um, societies, they share the same um, relational orientations. Maybe these are the areas that can suggest for cross-cultural differences. But even within the same uh, Chinese culture orientation, you can see that um, this uh, these um, relational characteristics such as some um, fatalism, interdependence, or even a uh, classification, they, uh, they are the dimensions, uh, they show um, greater, greater individual variations. Um, I am speculating maybe these are the areas that acquire the potentials for explore um, cross-cultural incommensurabilities um, for the future research. Now I will pass um, the stage and the micro uh, microphone to um, Professor Wong. Now if we go back to the uh, um, discussion on commensurability and incommensurability, um, here I try to summarize um, the uh, uh, ways that we can find um, indications or indications or uh, reflections of um, the findings on our discussion on the uh, paired concept. Um, but here let's go directly to the um, uh, description of it. Um, first of all, uh, there we, there's support for claims for 
incommensurability with the individualism uh, slash collect collectivism concepts because there is high positive responses on most core concepts on both factors. And also there is high scale reliabilities in structural validity of the DFRF. Um, that means both factors are, uh, should be considered in studying the way self relates to others. And also um, there is uh, the support for claims for incommensurability with the dualism model underlying most relevant mainstream concepts. And that this is because there is an absence of negative correlation between the structure and the agency rational factor uh, or on the ratings of it in this study. That means they are not dichotomous extremes. In other words, uh, high ratings on rational um, core concepts do not re uh, lead to or do not appear with, what did I say, lower. Uh, higher, higher descent does not lead to lower on that end, yes. And then um, there's also a potential area of commensurability emerge, um, also the uh, potential areas of commensurability emerge from the literature has been reaffirmed um, as high positive ratings and smaller standard deviations on the rational or agency factor across samples, sample groups um, have um, indicated uh, the potential for commensurable similarities. And this is especially so when um, there is different uh, cultural learning and also socializing experiences across the three societies despite, despite their shared cultural tradition. Okay, um, I'm going to conclude with uh, a, with a with a request from C's, because as you can see in this study, we're not only silly enough to ask silly questions, we are silly enough to come up with silly answers to these silly questions, and we are even more, uh, even sillier to tell you that we can compare apples and oranges. And the silliest part is that we are telling you that you can find the commensurate similarities by going deep enough the unique aspects of each. And then last, the silliest is to say that we can show you how it can be done here. So, please, do we have the Academic Silliness Award? Okay, thank you for presenting a very complex paper in such a short period of time. Our last uh, presenter is Joseph Chen. Uh, it's my colleague. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think it is good to speak last, you know, especially in this panel, you know, with uh, Barry talking about the centrality of network and my uh, two other friends and colleagues, you know, talking about uh, the importance of uh, commensurability or guanxi or, um, you know, decontextualization, okay, or the limit of contextualization. Uh, I am also going to address the question of network in a way, uh, but the focus is on comparative communication studies, you know, looking at our own activities. And in fact, you know, um, uh, I draw on my personal experience and also my observations to, to shed light uh, on our practices and um, what we uh, used to know about uh, this f formation of the comparative communication network. Uh, let me... Here, right. Yeah, the, yesterday, you know, Clement, you know, talked a little bit about the changes in the field of comparative communication. Uh, I would like to revisit that a little bit, you know, to, as a way of recapping. Uh, in the 1980s, I was a uh, MPhil student in our school, and at that time, 
uh, Alice Edelstein, a visiting professor from University of Washington, uh, was visiting us, and I had the privilege of attending his uh, seminar. And also, you know, of course, he promoted his book. It is a booklet, very tiny. Uh, it is under the Comtech series of SAGE, and it is called Comparative Communication Research. Uh, but that is in 1982. And, you know, the, uh, other scholars also have about the importance of comparative studies. Then uh, they include, you know, um, like Blomer, uh, Gurevich, uh, McLeod, Rosengren, and so on. And, you know, they published a book on comparative speaking in uh, 1992. Now, some two decades after the early course for study in comparative study, uh, it is still more often said than done. And at the same time, we begin to see uh, different uh, calls uh, calling for de-westernizing uh, communication studies, as in the case of uh, James Caron and Park. It is in 2000, and this book was quite uh, widely cited. I think many people echo uh, to their concerns. And the other um, the call is for internationalization. Uh, this call has been uh, made by Daya Thuzu, um, John Downing, and very recently by C.C. Lee, you know, who, who was here yesterday. Uh, and the very title is Internationalizing International Communication. Uh, now, the, the look, looking at uh, the more recent indicators, uh, it seems to me that there is a not noticeable turn. Uh, we can put quote unquote on it, maybe a comparative turn, you know. Uh, too early to announce this probably, you know, but you know, at least from the figures and also from the uh, indicators um, of my living environment, uh, I find that is the case. Now first, you know, I have been teaching a course on global and comparative communication. Uh, it is a compulsory course, you know, for our students, you know, whether you like it or not, you know, it is, uh, a required course. Now, the, uh, a problem for me is, you know, to make up the list. As you know, we don't have uh, standard textbooks. So I have to make up the list of readings for the students. Uh, in the past, I find it rather difficult to identify uh, solid comparative studies or genuine uh, comparative studies for the students. Uh, but in recent years, I find that, you know, uh, I can update my reading list uh, more readily. Uh, I can check it out, and then there will be a new crop of uh, research, and then I can uh, choose the one that fit the course. So, you know, th th I feel better about it. Uh, the other thing is, uh, I personally came across, you know, two or three uh, large-scale research projects. Uh, you know, uh, they're coordinators and, uh, among us, you know, uh, one is the Cohen's project on foreign TV news project. Uh, it involves 20-some uh, countries, and it is completed and published in a book um, uh, on foreign TV. Uh, it involves, you know, uh, uh, quite a few scholars. Uh, the other one is Worlds of Journalism Study. You know, this one is headed by uh, Hanish uh, Thomas, and uh, before this, you know, there was a smaller scale uh, world study of journalists. Uh, so whether you call it two projects or one project, it's it, up to you, you know, but uh, I think, you know, this belong to the large scale projects that I referred to. Uh, so this is unthinkable, you know, uh, 20 years ago or 30 years ago. Um, maybe, you know, at that time, UNESCO would sponsor something like that, you know. Uh, but uh, in comparatively, you don't see this kind of large-scale projects uh, sprouting, you know, from our colleagues. Um, well, these are the, what are the personal uh, observations. Uh, a more systematic study is by Clement, you know, of course. Uh, I don't want to go into the details, but, uh, you know, uh, just to note that, 
you know, before 1980, you know, there is just one uh, comparative study. Uh, I, I think, you know, I talked to Clement yesterday, you know, he said, you know, he can uh, fine tune uh, the net so that, you know, more can be uh, caught uh, by the net. Uh, so the, it, it depends on how uh, the, the width, you know, of the net or, or the holes uh, in the net. You know, the smaller the size, the less, and then the, the big, uh, uh, it depends on uh, the size of the holes. So if you want to catch more fish, then, uh, you know, the, uh, make it smaller. As, and then before 1989, uh, so altogether five, and then 1990 to 1911. But then from the 90s to the uh, turn of the century, you know, it is 35. And then, you know, in the last few years, uh, it is not yet halfway into the decade. Uh, but already, you know, it registered 64. Now, I'm not talking about the absolute size over here. Well, what is important to me is uh, the uh, trend, uh, the, uh, uh, the leap in terms of quantity. Uh, I'm talking about the trend rather than the absolute number. Now, in face of this uh, phenomenon, you know, my question is, uh, first, how to account for the rise of comparative studies, you know, how to explain it, you know. Uh, what are the factors that have given impetus to comparative communication? Uh, the second question uh, is, how scholars can methodologically benefit from the comparative research network? Now, we can benefit from a network in very many different ways, you know, but my focus is on uh, what methodological benefit uh, can you get from it. Now, some of the factors, um, I think, you know, it has something to do with globalization. Uh, of course, you know, globalization itself can be a very elusive concept, you know, as said by uh, CIS, you know, uh, quite a few years back. But then if you take it to be a social process, that refers to uh, the increase of interconnectedness and interpenetration around the world, then, you know, probably there is much less the disagreement. Uh, if you put aside, you know, the uh, political dimension that, that comes with the package. Now, as a result of this glo globalization, um, there are two changes. One has to do with the reconfiguration of social reality and mediated reality. The social reality and mediated reality are our subject matter for scholars, for social scientists, especially you know, for uh, the communication researchers. Now, if this reality is reconfigured, the questions for us is you know, how we can cope with this changing reality. And I think you know, it calls for a more global, comparative, and transnational perspective. Without it, then it is difficult to grasp you know, what is really happening there. The other one is it, it has to do with uh, globalization uh, as the increase in awareness that the world is shrinking. Now, this is Robinson's I idea, you know, but it is happening to many of us, the academics. Uh, the, or just over the lunch table today, uh, a few of us talk about the RAE, Research Assessment Exercise, you know. It is a, global, a globalized phenomenon where we imported it you know, from Australia, from the UK, and even though you may not have RAE exactly, you know, but you know, you have some exercise of that kind. Now, why all this uh, playing together is a so-called international standard. You measure, you try to measure yourself, you know, up to that standard, you know. And the universities look for extent of collaborations with the other universities. Uh, look for international standards. Our university asks us, you know, what your school would aspire to be in five years' time, in 10 years' time. So we have to think of the uh, 
outstanding schools in the world. And then we will try to say, you know, in 10 years' time, we will be there, you know. But you can say, well, I'm not, not saying this is clever, you know. Uh, what I'm saying is, you know, they're trying to globalize the standard and uh, making it more international. And with that, you know, what do you do? And so comparison become uh, part of the reality. And the other one, it has to do with uh, the development of an a very efficient and extensive global communication infrastructure. Uh, I think, you know, the uh, bill this morning, you know, has laid out, you know, what is happening and what may be happening in the future. Uh, I think, you know, it really uh, shows uh, what is uh, radically changing uh, the way of communication uh, in the world. Now, and this is, uh, of course, nowadays, you know, what we have is the internet. Uh, and then, uh, plus, uh, the, the mobile device uh, very soon. And with this kind, with, well, without this communication infrastructure, then, you know, global networks can hardly be formed. Uh, even if you can form a global network, and it is much less uh, efficient. So this also paves way for uh, the formation of what may be called the comparative um, uh, research network. And with this network, uh, it uh, encourages or promotes interactivity and sharing uh, at, at and between different levels. And it also allows uh, dual life. Now, by dual life, it means uh, it is not just uh, existence online, but also offline. You know. uh, on another occasion, I talked to Tom you know, about whether you know, there's a need for uh, his colleagues to meet. You know. uh, he said it is very essential. You know. Other than, otherwise, you know, your project members uh, would not have that kind of identity identifying with the project or world project. So um, with this, then, you know, what I'm focusing on is, you know, uh, there is a, an emergence of what may be called com communication research network or more specifically, the comparative research network. Uh, it is a network-like structure of professional ties among researchers which enables comparative studies. And uh, this has to do with uh, the networking opportunities that Barry just talked uh, a moment ago. You know, they had, uh, the opportunities for international networking uh, has tr grown tremendously uh, in the last 10 years. Uh, students are required to make presentations in international conventions and then the schools also set up uh, funds you know, for the students to travel. Uh, so, you know, uh, there's a lot of chance for them to get exposed. Compared with uh, the 1980s, you know, uh, I was lucky enough to be given a chance to, you know, to visit uh, the Honolulu, uh, uh, to have a conference with Wilbur Schramm and the, all those big guys at the time. You know. the, the, the reason is not because the university supports me, uh, but because, you know, C.C. Lee at the time was my advisor, he could not make to the conference. So, um, <laughs> so we, we, I, I, you know, uh, we had a co-author paper and then we, we did it together. So I had a chance to visit it. But it was a, an exception at the time. Uh, of course, it, uh, I benefit a lot from it. Um, well, with all these opportunities for networking, um, you know, uh, I think the emphasis is on uh, weak ties uh, rather than on strong ties, okay? Uh, probably we will have a different opinion on this, you know, but, you know, based on my observations uh, of the comparative research network, uh, the weak ties tend to uh, exert its strength. Uh, and, you know, uh, lastly, um, you know, in terms of globalization, there is an also an emergence of uh, research culture, you know. Uh, by research culture, I refer to the epistemology, uh, the methodology people use, you know, uh, the training in theories, uh, the research outlook. Because of uh, education in the West, 
uh, the domination of education in the West. Um, well, we do have the local uh, graduate schools you know, uh, in the developing countries, but it is more often the case for their teachers to get trained in the West. And also, you know, when they use the, the textbooks and so on and so forth, you know, for all the good reasons and the bad reasons, you know, they have to resort to the same research culture. Now, by having a similar research culture, then, you know, uh, there's a, 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 it is m more feasible for people to collaborate, to work on comparative studies. Otherwise, if you have diverging uh, research outlooks, and the cost of harmonizing the outlooks would be tremendous, and it is almost unsurmountable. And that's why, you know, it saves a lot of time and money and effort um, uh, 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 to uh, engage in collaborative studies with people sharing the same culture. Uh, on the second question in regard to the methodological benefits that one can uh, get from a uh, comparative uh, research network, yes. Uh, the first question has to do with the very idea of contextualization, okay? <clears throat> um, I think, you know, the, uh, in comparative methodology, uh, equivalent is the key idea. You know, without equivalent, then, you know, the comparison probably uh, doesn't make sense. So, uh, in terms of equivalence, there can be equivalence at different levels. Uh, systemic, conceptual, measurement, indicator, and um, how do you achieve equivalence that becomes the key question. And contextualization, you know, in my estimation, uh, is the key to this challenge. It, be it relates to uh, two major issues in comparative methodology. One is conceptualization, the other one is data gathering. So, you know, I, uh, in the, my paper, I discussed, you know, how, cont how contextualization uh, serve a aid in um, establishing uh, conceptual equivalence and also equivalence in data gathering. Uh, with the concepts, uh, it is the basic unit of social science theories. I think, you know, uh, in most cases, it is the task of acad academics uh, to l delimit the applicability and relevance of a concept, you know. By, delimit uh, by delimiting, I mean, you know, the extent to which it is applicable or not applicable at, at the same time. Now, um, uh, in my paper, I talk about the case of professionalism. Uh, I think, you know, uh, professionalism is really a contested uh, concept, you know. Uh, many people would have different interpretations. Uh, and then, if you, uh, I, uh, several people, uh, my colleagues, you know, Professor Law and uh, me and others, uh, have been studying journalists in Greater China. And then, Greater China is quite an interesting case, you know, a big case, because in it, it is more like a microcosm you know, of the world. Now, you have, we have the liberal uh, place such as Hong Kong, a city, and then you know, the, uh, a region such as Taiwan, and uh, mainland China. You know, they, they, uh, uh, it, it, uh, in terms of ideal types, you can have at least two or three. And professionalism in these places uh, are very different. Uh, uh, especially in the case of China versus Hong Kong and Taiwan. Uh, over there, you know, professionalism is something new. It is articulated, but in a very piecemeal fashion. And then over here in Taiwan, uh, it is um, uh, better articulated, maybe to different levels. So that y uh, if we think of all this professional journalism, partition journalism, as the case of mainland China, now, there is a need, you know, for a unifying concept of higher order. And we talk about, you know, whether apples and origins can be compared or not. And then with a higher level, then you can compare them.
but yet at the same level uh, within, then probably you know they may not be uh, comparable. And then in terms of data gathering, uh, uh, I have several examples over here, you know, uh, but I just want to uh, maybe talk about the case of. Uh, the suppression effect of social desirability in tapping generous ethical orientation. Uh, in our study of uh, comparative journalists, uh, we uh, want to see how the journalists uh, take different ethical uh, standards. And we all understand all uh, journalists tend to pay lip service you know, to these ethical uh, issues. And we were afraid that this social desirability would suppress the real intention and behavior uh, of the journalists, especially those in uh, mainland China. So we set out you know, to do you know, one is to ask the personal opinion. And then we also had this asking the same question about uh, the response of the peers. And then uh, we. Uh, see whether there is a gap between the beliefs and uh, the observed behavior of the peers. Uh, it turns out that there is a large gap in mainland China. And then um, Hong Kong happens to have to, uh, the smallest gap. And Taiwan is somewhere in between. Uh, it shows that um, uh, our mainland Chinese journalists are more hypocritical. Okay? And the Hong Kong people are more straightforward and then more pragmatic, and then they, they say what they believe in. Um, and also, in terms of uh, the, the last methodological benefit, you know, has to do with interpretation and explanation. Uh, the question is, you know, how do you do it? You have to appeal to other knowledge. Uh, by other knowledge, Smelzer refers to the knowledge that we know about a system. And in this case, the comparative network, if appropriately done, then you know, they can provide uh, the enough information for you to judge uh, or to explain, to interpret. It is not a foolproof method, you know, but at least you know, with the contextual information, then probably you can make a better uh, judgment. And a uh, case in point is the belief reality gap that I just mentioned. You know, why it is the least in Hong Kong? The, the, the belief gap is the smallest in Hong Kong. Probably it has something to do uh, with the rule of law culture in Hong Kong and also with the establishment of the ICAC, Independent Agency Against Corruption, you know, the very in intimidating agency. Um, even for the teachers, we are not supposed to receive a gift, you know, um, um, uh, more expensive than $500 Hong Kong. Okay, uh, very quickly, okay, one minute. Uh, there is a noticeable comparative turn. Uh, it has to do with uh, globalization, the advancements of ICTs, the convergence of research culture, the internationalization of education and research, the formation of a comparative scholarly network. Um, it helps to maintain equivalence at the conceptual measurement and sampling level. It also facilitates the use of contextualization as a way to explain the similarities and difference between uh, 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 the difference observed across social systems. Uh, now, with this comparative turn, it is a positive response to the call for de-westernization, uh, but it is far from uh, really, you know. Uh, giving uh, a final solution to it. Uh, more comparisons within the East and between the East and the West remain to be done. Now, I think you know, we should also avoid what may be called Asian centrism as well. What we are more interested in is whether a theory can explain reality, whether the theory you know, t uh, is generalizable, or to what extent it is generalizable. Uh, that is more, more important. So I think ultimately we're not so much interested in the origin of the researcher or the co very context, the origin of the context, you know, be, because we want to really enhance our understanding uh, of the field and of the world. Yeah, thank you. No.
I would like to invite Professor Chen Lin to discuss and make comment on the three papers. Professor Chen. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so instead of squeezing up, uh, all the way up there. Okay, uh, first of all, I would like to thank the, the organizer for inviting me to participate in this uh, very, very interesting uh, uh, conference. Although I couldn't attend all the uh, sessions, hopefully I have this thick book that will help me uh, go through the things that I miss. And, uh, and also, uh, I just, uh, when, when I got the invitation and I look at the content, I was like, ah, how am I going to do this? And then the organizer very graciously say, well, just you know, comment in the area in general. And uh, as a, uh, as so they allow me to, to, to make my comments as an informed scholar. So this is what I'm going to do. But uh, as I read through the papers, I start to very much appreciate the work of the organizers. This is actually a wonderful uh, panel. Uh, that is not so traditional, but you know, a very, very thoughtful one. Uh, uh, since we are in the spirit of comparison and uh, compare a lot of different kind of things, so I compare the three papers. And I realized uh, it, it is uh, very well thought out and the three papers actually form a kind of triangle uh, relationship with overlapping uh, interests and perfectly overlapping in the sense that one paper has one overlap with the next paper but not the other one and so on goes around. We have three areas, uh, the, the network, the relationship, and then comparison. So this area, each of these areas discussed by two papers but not uh, all three of papers. So this is what I'm going to do then uh, uh, instead of doing it uh, paper by paper, I'm going to cross-reference them because of this kind of uh, connection among them. And uh, there are, of course, different ways also uh, uh, making comments or uh, thinking. And one is to do the substantive. This is the part that I cannot do because at least two of the papers, really, I'm uh, only minimally familiar as a scholar. You know, I know what network is and how it works. Some people study it, but I do not study it, and I don't read that much about networks. And also comparative study, I'm relatively familiar, but uh, what I'm really familiar with, it's not quite the kind that uh, Joseph was uh, presenting. So uh, the last paper, of course, I've, because they were talking about a relationship and particularly talking about Chinese culture, this is the area I'm most uh, familiar with also. So instead of uh, attending to the substance, I would just talk about anything else, uh, the remaining. <laughs> first of all, is uh, the first paper, Changes of Thai. Uh, uh, Wellman, Professor Wellman's paper, looking at the changes of uh, ties in the research network. This, this type of study is very unique. Uh, as clearly pointed out, it's not very often done. And I think one of the reasons why it is often, not often done is pro this kind of research network is relatively rare also. Uh, you don't find many of this kind of research network which is supported. And this is one of the point that comments I had in mind is, you know, it really re requires institutional support for this kind of uh, research network to run. And, and, uh, and the funding as well. In addition to the, the, the common interests among the researchers and also the common topics for them to be able to do. And also, uh, secondly, I understand it's even rarer among social science, not to say humanities. Uh, it's more, relatively more common in, in natural science, computers, engineers, you know, they very often need to work together. A reality problem, it's, it's not discipline bound. So people have to work together, but in humanities and uh, social sciences, uh, uh, it's too complex for us to work together to, 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 give, uh, 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 to give us a solution. So this, this, this paper look at, uh, this particular uh, research, look at the research network and look at how uh, network, uh, so to speak, function using the term that I'm more familiar with. So this, this reminds me of uh, what we study uh, in communication. Mostly uh, many people study media. And media, there is a medium and there is the content. So 
using that analogy, it looks like this uh, study look at the structure aspect of it, the median aspect a little bit more, and uh, content a little bit less. And this is where uh, I'm sure because you know reading through it instead of just listening to you, understand that actually it, it, it itself is a large project. There's a lot of other projects published or still ongoing, uh, looking at the other aspect of it. So I would look forward to reading at the content aspect in terms of you know not just uh, what kind of people are talking to whom about what in general, but specifically what you are talking about. And those are kind of things that may have implications uh, towards the uh, to functioning of the network and how, how they sustained. Now, the most interesting part of this study actually is looking at the ties, and which is just another way uh, of saying relationship. Uh, basically, they, they are uh, four different types of uh, relationship. So this is where it's overlapping with the, uh, with the next paper uh, on uh, uh, incommensurability or commensurability. And one thing I find it very interesting is that the challenges uh, that the research, uh, the research network face, that the diversity, uh, and this actually uh, fits the findings from other area of study, because I, uh, I'm interested, uh, for those of you who know me, that I, I'm interested in intercultural communication studies and organization diversity and social diversity as well. And one of the findings there uh, uh, matches what is reported in this network as well. In terms of diversity is helpful when it is uh, diversity of uh, ideas and concepts and experience, but it is difficult when you have different uh, I, uh, uh, identities and cultural backgrounds. And this is, uh, in, in this particular case, it becomes the difficult, uh, uh, physical difficulties, the distance and the institutions. And this, since we are on, on aspect of culture, this is something that I want, uh, I will uh, return to later. So uh, for me, uh, this type of study has uh, huge policy implications that uh, Professor Wellman already mentioned in, t in terms of you know, how to uh, 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 evaluate or assess the benefit of this, uh, this type of network. Instead of just looking at the output, there are other uh, non-tangible values as well that, that need to be taken into consideration. And for me, of course, uh, in that case, uh, because this is already an existing uh, network, uh, for me, the, the other question is, I mentioned at the beginning, the, the policy uh, support, the institutional support. Uh, my understanding is this kind of research network probably is more common in European uh, 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 nations because of the funding structure and probably part of it in Canada as well. But uh, as far as I know, United States, uh, very little. and. Hong Kong, I don't know, I haven't heard of it. Maybe there is uh, something uh, there. So it, it definitely requires uh, society or government support for this kind of uh, uh, venture. And another thing that, I, another com comment I have is uh, related to, to the changing of tie and how it is actually maintained later. And I, I was wondering, you know, uh, if this kind of uh, uh, study can be carried out on relatively informal. Uh, this kind of uh, research network is already, relatively speaking, informal, but there is even less formal type of uh, research network than the ones that uh, uh, Joseph was make, make, uh, referring to uh, that uh, ba basically established, established purely based on people's common interests uh, uh, in order to do it and how, and I think it's more, more interesting to see how a lot of these social are uh, the based latent network eventually uh, on different occasions becomes a realized into research network. And this is the part that it will tie into the, uh, to the last paper uh, by uh, Joseph Professor Chang that talks about the network aspect of it. Both paper uh, didn't talk about how it is formed. Now the last, the last paper talking about network and how it can be helpful, and it's a very a detailed list, very specific aspect of uh, how methodologically it, it can be useful for people and how actually how to do it, and very, very really good uh, points. Uh, but one of the most important points that I was looking for, uh, I didn't find, that is how it actually come into existence. And this is these two, you know, people uh, just mentioned kind of feel like uh, it is there, so how, this is how it works, but how it becomes there. And this is a lot of things were probably taught 
uh, by your professors, advisors, this, uh, uh, some of the stories uh, that, that was told in the paper. So th this will be an aspect, actually, and particularly b because I study organization as well, part of it. You know, organization, socialization, there is a beginning and there's an end. Any kind of relationship, there's a beginning, there's an end. So uh, what's the beginning part and the end part as well? That would be uh, something that's interesting. And also the, uh, uh, the second paper talking about mensurability, and this is uh, by uh, Professor Wang and Wang and Huang. Uh, 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 commensurability, as I mentioned, is a concept in philosophy of science, trying to compare uh, theories uh, in terms of uh, conceptual framework, related conceptual framework or paradigm, and also the relevant em empirical evidence and, and data, whether it uh, fit. Uh, it, it support or refute uh, the conceptual uh, establishment. And it just happened to be something that I uh, uh, related to something I didn't really study uh, commensurality, but uh, my, uh, my own research <laughs> interest started from, uh, I used to be an English student, I studied language, and one of the things I study is called semantic gap, if anybody have heard this term. And semantic gap is how you conceptualize, uh, understand the world, and put it into language. And then I was interested in cross-cultural differences and see how you know how are, uh, it looks like it's the same world. However, different cultures have different ways of putting this world into languages. And sometimes to the extent that they are just completely uh, untranslatable, equivalent. Uh, they are things that you just cannot translate. Uh, so, so uh, and this I think uh, applies so equally to this uh, to this commensurability or comparison studies in general that uh, uh, they are uh, they are ways to compare and and depends on where you do and there are sometimes cases it just absolutely cannot be complete uh, uh, compared well then uh, 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 then that's a different story. In any case, you know, I, I heard quite a bit uh, in this conference talking about compare oranges and apples, and some people uh, yesterday said compare uh, apples with uh, bananas, right? So, and there is a reason why it says banana instead of something else, right? It didn't say monkey. It, uh, uh, the, the person didn't say monkey, didn't say building, because these are all fruit, right? So this is where, <laughs> where uh, the semantic back comes in. There is a kind of comparison one can make, and this is actually also uh, mentioned by Kuhn, the, the ta taxonomy. Taxonomy, there is a way to understand the world, to classify them. So this is where you, know, you can compare them at a certain level. If you cannot compare them at this level, then maybe you go up a little bit abstract levels, and then that is where you can compare. So this, this actually is a fact that has been referred to uh, in both uh, this paper and then uh, Professor John's paper also, that follows. Uh, of course, you know, if you are outside of taxonomy altogether, then it's simply uncomparable. But usually, those are the kind of things we don't study, uh, hopefully. So uh, in relation to our uh, language use, then of course, uh, the taxonomy uh, definitely have uh, a lot to do with language, but it's not the kind of natural language we're talking about, but uh, you know, the, the, the technical language, scientific language, the languages that people use, scientists, uh, scientists use, or scholars use to uh, communicate about what they uh, are thinking. And this is where also uh, difficulties tremendous difficulties for us as social scientists or humanities trying to study. Because uh, you know the 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 the, uh, the 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 philosophy of so, uh, science, they are talking about science, right? So relatively speaking, these are the kind of things that is relatively more measurable. But what we are studying mostly are concepts. They are things that uh, uh, can be measured, also uh, uh, real things, physical things. But a lot of them are just abstract type of things. So there are much more room. Uh, for interpretation, so this is, uh, uh, you know, increase my admiration uh, tremendously to this particular study. It's not silly; it is something that is very, very useful and very helpful uh, for us to do uh, to see what can be done. So the uh, the example uh, of this DFRF. Uh, is a particular case, the Chinese, uh, 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 Chinese relations trying to, uh, uh, 
to 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 use e this example to illustrate, you know, how uh, at what levels what things can be compared, what cannot be compared. And this, by the way, this paper, uh, uh, the presentation actually has improved tremendously. So uh, <laughs> reduce my uh, comments. I have a few questions related to it, but it's all answered now <laughs> in your presentation. So um, it's no there. And also, this this particular study, you can uh, you know look at uh, the Chinese relationship, the Chinese communication, which is something that I'm very familiar with. But uh, I will not comment because this is not part of the theme. And the other one is comparative aspect of it. And this is where I uh, uh, I have already made my comments earlier. Now, th lastly, two uh, two uh, aspect of it, I think it may be worth thinking in, in terms of comparison also. Is uh, it's, I find it very very interesting that the structural uh, the structural uh, dimension uh, or factor of it that where uh, two things uh, one of them is harmony to be found uh, the most important quality and also this is where uh, uh, this is a dimension all five factors a very small uh, variance and I was thinking that uh, uh, one of course may be the artifact of all these societies. And the other one I was thinking in relation to this particular culture is, and this is uh, something that actually has been in my mind for a long time, but I just didn't have time to, to really carefully think about it. It's the, the dimension of collectivism versus uh, individualism, and the Hofstede's the other one, power distance. Because uh, they have found these two uh, dimensions to be highly correlated, although uh, it's considered to be mutually exclusive, uh, but, I have the observation or sense that actually collectivism and individualism is somehow subject to the other one. In other words, in order for individualism, collectivism to hold, uh, particularly collectivism to hold, you need to have, uh, you, in order for it to hold, you have first of all the hierarchy. Otherwise, if it's all individual hierarchy, it makes no sense at all. So this may be, you know, something that we, we, we can look into. This is kind of way off, but still, uh, I find it interesting. So I mentioned it here. And also, uh, uh, another one is for further exploration that the structure uh, dimensions seem to be more discriminative of the societies than the relational dimension. So what what it means by commensurability. So this will be a uh, further. Uh, exploration. And then, uh, hang on. Oh yes, now the last, uh, the, uh, the last one, the last paper have to do, uh, uh, share with this, uh, the second paper, the, the, the Chinese relationship, the, the aspect of comparison. And uh, uh, I mentioned it already that, you know, it's, uh, Professor Chan's uh, paper, it, this is actually an essay. It's just a, a lot of thinking and uh, he has, uh, the paper has expressed a lot of things that I could have said <laughs> as a respondent, but he has said, uh, said it and said it much, much better. Uh, you know, advantage of uh, contextual familiarity, uh, the, uh, and, and then something that I, I will put it a different way, contextual uh, 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 familiarity, uh, if it's me, I would say cultural insider's knowledge. And this is one, uh, uh, maybe very one common aspect of communication studies that you know everybody study everything else and culture uh, is usually not mentioned. Uh, of course, for good reasons, because everything else make up to be a culture, right? So if you say culture, nobody knows what you're talking about. But if you're talking about particular context, particular history, economic, then people knows what it is. But still, there is kind of a residual type of thing that may be uh, worth looking at in terms of specifically what about this context uh, that make it interesting and make it compar uh, compar uh, comparable and also make it worth studying uh, uh, across cultures. So um, uh, I think that's where I have to say. Thank you. Uh I was asked to extend the session by 30 minutes, so we still have 15 minutes for comment questions from the floor. Any questions or comments? Okay, answer. Yeah, I have a uh, specific question for Barry Wellman. Um, 
yeah, I like your concept of um, um, individualized network. Um, but I want to interpret, use my experience to interpret your concept. It's true that nowadays, like, like we use mobile phone, uh, Facebook to connect to thousands of individuals across the world with their boundaries. But, um, but I, as I, like from your in, like, like presentation, I sense that, that the kind of grouping or communities are not as important. But, but my experience is that like, like in Facebook, they, we have, in Facebook, they have the function of groupings. Like in, in WhatsApp, um, like the, the mobile chatting groups, actually I chat more with groups within the it, like within uh, the WhatsApp group more than everybody in the WhatsApp group. I have like like at least two thousand people on the WhatsApp group, but only chat to those people within the communities, um, you inside the groups of the WhatsApp. So what I'm arguing is that um, there's a qualitative difference between. Um, um, so-called networked individuals and networked communities um, using the same kind of technologies. Um, that's why, um, like, like the China, like Chinese invented so-called what WeChat. WeChat groups basically we talk to very like like core groups of friends. Um, that means we are not so much individualized. Um, um, and and we talk more with their friends than than anybody that we know on the groups. Um, so that's why, yeah, that's what, what I want to hear from you. How much like um, um, is it true that like groups or communities communities are still very much individualized with this kind of technology or social network? Any more questions? I will let them answer your question later, okay. To two observation trends in our well, in, in tech in communication technology. The internet and the mobile phone are going in different directions. Well in fact for some reason the literature shows that internet tends to you know, to be universal phenomenal. You tend to reach the, the, the audience in, in, in remote places through the internet. But the mobile phone, with the advent of mobile phone, you tend to, you know, cluster around French, uh, you tend to form a community nearby, uh, near to you. So in that sense, networks tend to, seems to me, uh, can be defined in two different senses. And there seems to be two communities. One is the, you know, a friend. One is, well, in fact, there are two communities. So how can you explain this uh, phenomenon? Uh, how can your concept cover two senses of communities here? Thank you. Uh, probably ask you to answer the question first before you forgot the question. Thank you. I actually have three sets of questions to ask, answer because uh, Professor Oh, I'm so sorry, Professor Chen. Uh, comments I wanted to re address soon, but let's let let me work backwards. Uh, one of the ideas of networked individualism is that people do relate to multiple communities. Uh, sometimes the, uh, these are neighborhoods, proximate ones. Sometimes they are dispersed. Like ma many of the people in this room have gathered from many places in a forming uh, community. But most importantly, I have come to. East Asia, I am working in Singapore and in Hong Kong, uh, mostly to see whether the ideas I, dis I formulated in the network book, which we explicitly say is based on American and Canadian data, um, make some sense here. And of course, I am a world expert. I've been here four weeks, so I know everything, right? <laughs> it's a joke. Um, but my first sense, and you can all tell me if I'm wrong, is it makes some sense, but less so. I think there's a change in, in Eastern Asia, I wouldn't dare to talk about Southern or Western Asia, towards a more network philosophy. I mean, I think of all the mainland students here who have relations here and back in the mainland, but it's certainly, we're in a much more family-based situation uh, than in North America 
and maybe less job mobility. As, as I think Jeanette was talking a lot about that in, in her talk. So I, I welcome your comments, and I also welcome your evidence. Individual experience is great as a first way to think about things, but you need, you must have systematic evidence in order to make some generalizations or not. You can't just, I mean, that was the problem with Sherry Turkle's book. She general, anybody read Alone Together here? Oh, too bad. Um, <laughs> she generalized from her daughter, which strikes me as particularly weird. Okay. So that, that's my comment to Professor Fung and, and Professor uh, Chung. Um, and let me go back to Professor Chan's comments. One is network work is quite prevalent in North America. Remember, I was talking about network scholarship as a way of thinking about network work in general. Hong Kong is the hub of many corporations and or the head of branch plants of many Asian headquarters of corporations. These folks are almost always in, involved in network work, and this needs to be studied. Uh, in the United States, to do a major research grant, not only in the sciences, uh, you must build in a component for analysis of how people are working together at a distance. So airplanes are really important. Many of the scholars here who have come from other countries, I mean the people working in Hong Kong, also have re important work relationships uh, going beyond that. So, and I'm thinking very much of Singapore, which uh, I'm sad to say is probably forging ahead of Hong Kong as an international hub because of political differences. And in Singapore, we're now starting a research project where people are involved in many aspects of work. What I wonder about in, in Hong Kong, whether academics, and maybe in Singapore, academics are siloed. In, I've discussed several, I've talked with several students. They said, I'm working on X. And then I say, well, are you working with Professor Y? And they say, no, I'm working with Professor Z. And the fact that they cannot work with more than one person, maybe I'm over exaggerating some nice conversations at lunch <laughs> and on the bus, strikes me as, as something that's unfortunate. And there's, I think a sharing of knowledge economy uh, is very important rather than just holding on very tightly to your own students and your own people. So I thank you very much for listening. Um, and perhaps I was not as coherent as I could be. Uh, the book's 360 pages. We have many uh, reports going on about our work of scholarship. I didn't have a chance to say. We call it the Naval Project. For This is our Naval because yeah, this is a nonverbal communication mode because we have studied our own research network of 200 scholars. So thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Barry, can you, you, should, you should mention the Chinese version of networks is coming out in a couple of months after the Chinese New Year. Chinese version of networks is coming out in a couple of months. Uh, translated by Yang Bashu at Peking University on communications. It's too bad he's not here. Uh, we're doing an interview this afternoon with Jack and to, uh, to discuss the book. And it's also coming out in Korean. The translation is done from my Korean friends here. Um, I'm very excited by these things. Thank you. And, oh, yeah, last point. In 2007, the networked individuals idea was on the Chinese national entrance exam. So somebody in, in Peking is taking it seriously. Colin. I, I don't have a book to sell. Um, now, um, I'm, I'm a bit worried about the work that the term culture is being asked to do in this, uh, this, this well, actually throughout this conference. And I think there's a danger that there will be three problems with culture. First of all, culture is being reduced to attitude. And I think that any full definition of culture would involve behavior. And as many, many studies have shown, there is very often a distance between attitude and behavior. So for example, people talk about the collective dimension of Chinese culture. 
Um, and I'm sure if you sat my students down in um, uh, a classroom and asked them to, to tick the boxes, they would come up with an impeccably Chinese set of attitudes which would include collectivism. And then I go down to the MTR um, at 6 o'clock in the evening, and I see behavior which is so ruthlessly individual and so ruthlessly and viciously anti-collective that the MTR Corporation has itself produced a video trying to persuade Chinese people not to behave in that sort of way. So I think maybe attitudes don't tell us all the story. Yeah? Maybe Chinese culture is a little bit more complicated than ticking the boxes. Uh, maybe if we examined how people behave, we might find a richer version of culture. My second worry is that there's a sense of culture as being something which is um, eternal, something which is essential, that there is something called Chinese culture. Now, it may well be the case, I don't know enough about Chinese culture, that there is some invariant culture which has existed since, you know, since before the dynasties. Um, but certainly the the small, pathetic culture which I know something about, which has only got a history of you know, a couple of thousand years, um, British culture, has been transformed radically during that period. A very famous book by a scholar called Parkin, who looked at the way in which between 1750 and 1850, Britain was transformed from the country of riots and rebellions and revolts and unpleasantness to the country of you know, the well-behaved, the, the civic, the uh, responsible. So maybe. Nothing as dramatic in Chinese culture, perhaps. Perhaps there are greater degrees of uniformity. But it might be worth asking the question whether Chinese culture is a static thing. And whether, perhaps, given that there are rapid social changes in China and rapid economic changes in China, there might also be changes in Chinese culture. And the third one I worry about is that when I look at, uh, again, this pathetic little culture in which I grew up, British culture, it's not a single thing. It's a site of struggles, bitterly contested between different social groups, between male and female, between rich and poor, between Scottish and English, between uh, a whole range of different groups. And the, what, we, what we take as, let's say, British culture, the culture of the BBC, say, is not British culture. It's the culture of the dominant group in Britain, the metropolitan white male elite. So to what extent is it? Maybe, again, Chinese culture is different. Maybe Chinese culture is uniformly shared and identical across all 1.3 billion people, and there are no conflicts. This is possible. But from my narrow experience, it seems to me that you know, cultures aren't like that. They're contested. They're fought over. So when we use the term culture, I think we need a much, much richer concept of culture if we want to explain how the world works. Okay, any more questions or comments? <laughs> okay. Yes, I have a comment that perhaps links to the previous comment. Um, and I was thinking about it, especially in relation to Christine and Georgina's paper and Ling Chen's uh, comments. Uh, we had discussed. Uh, we have discussed already the challenges and thinking comparatively whether. What do we do if we find too many similarities? So we, we address perhaps the problem and the challenge when we think are similarities as important as differences. Um, and while you were all speaking, I was thinking about the trouble with continuities. Um, and perhaps the, uh, our tendency, perhaps, you know, conceptually and empirically to, to often work through these binaries, you know, particularities, on one hand, and uh, collectivism, um, particularism on one end, universalism on the other, individualism on one end, and collectivism on the other. And I think you made a very good point that sometimes, you know, we have the continuity of meanings. And in relation to universalism and particularism, Robertson, who I think you referred to, you know, famously in the early 90s, spoke about universalizing particularism and particularizing universalism. And you spoke about how individualism might be uh, uh, actually uh, dependent on collectivism and the other way around. And I think it's this kind of uh, uh, the complexity and the trouble of continuities that perhaps sometimes uh, uh, we struggle with in thinking comparatively. Um, this deferral of meanings that creates uh, that troubles and 
uh, and some, uh, how it destroys our structures of clear stories that we can actually compare. And, you know, Barry mentioned um, the book Alone Together, which we actually teach, and our students love it. And the reason they love it is because it tells a clear story. It's the story of the binary. But what do we do with this kind of mess that comes in between and with these continuities? I, I don't quite know the answer. I'm just throwing it in there. We are running behind the schedule. Uh, I would like to ask uh, in one more question or comment. OK, no more questions or comments. OK. Maybe uh, let me start with um, um, the questions on um, the criticisms on um, you know um, uh, culture is not static and culture you know um, is um, different because of um, um, groups some um, things like that and actually I think that is um, that happens to um, the reason that um, well I use um, the dual con uh, dual factor to you know um, to try to make it as an alternative um, model to respond to the inadequacy in um, the uh, most uh, popular framework has been used for 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 for, for decades for example you know for like um, um, individualism basically emphasizes um, more on um, the agency okay but um, collectivism basically emphasize more on um, the structure. And if we uh, consider that um, um, relationship or the culture as a like, dynamic or like um, um, something that can be, uh, there, there are like you know, two kinds of mechanisms inside our, our, our mind and that can interact with each other. So that's the reason that you know, uh, this um, framework proposed that there are two, two factors that one is like, you know, um, based on um, rationality or based on agents, okay? And the other one is um, based on the structure thing. So, um, and, and I also agree um, with um, Professor uh, Collins that um, attitude is not behavior exactly. So basically this, um, um, the, the next step to, um, for this research is that to use this, um, uh, attitude or perception oriented um, scales to predict uh, relationship behavior such as um, long term versus some um, short term relationship or like you know um, transactional oriented relationship or like um, prof um, you know, uh, relationship with um, uh, relationship behaviors that might have some um, unethical implications, things like that. So, so um, well, um, the the, the, the that's, that would be uh, the next step for using this framework to um, go further. I think both mirrors and also Colin's uh, remarks touches on the greatest, as I see challenge of ethnic sci social scientists. Um, in a way, I think um, Chinese culture take change as given. That's the basis where we start everything. That's why our very important book, Yi Jing, is called Book of Change. So we look for patterns in changes, but changes are given. But in social sciences, the language and the tools that we are given to tackle issues and questions and problems are not designed for this purpose. So we have to wrestle very hard to see if this worldview of ours that we live in, this world, that the cultural world that we live in, can actually reflect in the work that we do. And I must say that, personally, I'm still struggling. Thank you. Uh, thank you to Chen Ning, you know, for her comments. You know, uh, very quickly, you know, on three issues. You know, 
uh, yeah, this is a, you know, acknowledgeably, you know, an essay or analytical piece, you know. I make use of my personal experience and, uh, and observations in um, making the analysis, you know, and as to why comparative study has making a turn and then uh, how, you know, the comparative research network uh, can be helpful methodologically. Uh, the second um, uh, issue has to do with um, uh, how, okay, how a comparative research network is formed. Uh, for that part, you know, the, frankly, you know, um, if I can uh, redo it or have more time to do it, in fact, I thought of doing it by uh, having two case studies, you know, one involving uh, Akiba Cohen's project and then uh, the also Tom's uh, project, you know, to see, to learn from them, you know, how they form the network, how the network is formed, you know. Or maybe if you are uh, uh, ambitious enough, you can expand the number of cases because they represent uh, certain types of research projects. There are other types, like centrally funded, you know, or, you know, smaller projects, not uh, such a big scale. Then, you know, would which ties be that important or it is more important to, um, to engage in uh, the uh, 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 project size of this kind? Uh, you know, to, for the small scale research project, you know, I didn't have time to, to get into that case, but it is very interesting. Uh, you now, well, there is one case involving a comparative study. Uh, it is out of a term paper in my class on global and comparative communication. And, you know, we, we tend to think of comparative study being expensive and uh, not done by the students. But it turns out that, you know, the students are required to uh, produce uh, comparative studies. And uh, one of the students decided to have a comparative study of university students in Hong Kong and uh, uh, the United States. And then he mobilized his acquaintance. Um, she, he came to know during one of the ICA poster sessions. And then he really had a uh, good sample, and then he turned out a good paper and uh, get the best student paper award from <laughs> AEJMC, and then now published in a very respectable uh, journal. You know, it is one of our colleagues now, you know. Uh, that is Michael, who had his birthday uh, yeah, uh, yesterday, you know. And uh, what my, my issue is how that comparative network is formed, you know. I mentioned in the paper, you know, but it can be compared with, with the big cases, the large ca cases, and see how this work together. Uh, one last issue has to do uh, with the use of terminology or ideas. Uh, that is the cultural insider or cultural outsiders, okay. And this can be brought into the picture too, definitely, you know. Like the anthropologists talk about the insider's account or the outsider's account. Now, which is more valid, you know. Uh, this is an enduring issue in social science. But, you know, for the comparative network, uh, I think, you know, uh, whether you're an outsider or insider, you have to know the context in order to make good judgment on the questions of equivalence and also to provide a good explanation for the similarities and differences. Otherwise, you know, uh, we are uh, getting nowhere. That, that is the point that I want to make. Yeah. Okay, thank you for the panelists. Thank you, Professor Chen, for your discussion. Thank you for your comment and question. Uh, okay. uh, let's have a short break. Sure, 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 sure.